Good morning. Grace and peace to you. It's so good to get to gather together to worship today. It's wonderful to see those of you who are gathered in person. We're equally glad to have those of you who are worshiping online. Thank you for being here this day. And having had several worship services already today, in every one of those, the music has been such a blessing to fill us and to aid in worship and help us connect and to praise our God. And I'm confident, I'm going to go ahead and say it ahead of time, I know our musicians are going to lead us and bless us again in this service as well. So thank you for your ministry and the way that you live your faith. Thank you for the way that you live your faith. My brothers and sisters, this is the day the Lord has made. It's beautiful outside and let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come and let us worship.
where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty Creator, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of Jesus' presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by Jesus' risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever, Amen. You can be seated. I invite you now to, as brothers and sisters in Christ, looking for opportunities to connect one with another, to watch our announcement video as ways to connect in these upcoming days. And as always, your newsletter that comes out on Wednesday afternoons has a lot more information of ways to connect. So won't you watch this now? And I look forward to seeing you in these opportunities together. Good morning, Sun River. Here are your announcements. That was some folks from the Agape Sunday School class. Our April Mission Impact Partner is Umcor Warehouse. We are collecting disaster relief supplies in the reception area throughout the month. Look in the newsletter for the list of needed items and make sure to sign up in the lobby for an opportunity to volunteer together at the warehouse on Tuesday from 9 to 12. Our backpack food and security team will pack for 25 students on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Our care team will be collecting diapers and gift cards for Gabby and their family to welcome Ember Lynn to the church family this Wednesday during our fellowship meal. On Thursday, our United Women of Faith will gather for a meeting at the church at 11 and our men's ministry will meet for lunch at Canton House at 1130. The Dismantling Racism team invites all of North Alabama United Methodists to join in holy conversations from 9 to noon this Saturday at Holmes Street United Methodist Church. Make sure to sign up online. Another opportunity on Saturday morning is to partner with J. Paul Hunger Relief at Solomon Temple anytime from 7 to 10 in the morning. Mark your calendars for the next Leadership Summit next Sunday at 2.30. Everyone is encouraged to come. And just a reminder, if your ministry team would like something in the newsletter or bulletin, emailing it to me by Tuesday would be super helpful. Thank you so much for all you do to serve and give back to the church. I hope you have a great morning. Well, friends, today's ministry uh, highlight is something that I've seen you do and you're continuing to do it today and this week, uh, and that is the Celebration of Life team. Uh, your ministry is a tremendous blessing. You've already sprung into action as we will celebrate our beloved Leon Smith's life today at 2 o'clock with visitation and 3.15 the service and then Tuesday we'll celebrate Gary Wood's life at 2 o'clock here and that team has already started preparing for today and for Tuesday so that all those family members and loved ones that after the life has been celebrated they can sit down to a nice meal connect with one another have that big deep breath and just be together. 
And what I don't think there's any more holy ministry that you can do is giving that gift to one another. And so I'm so thankful for our Celebration of Life team, those who are setting up and coordinating meals, those who are preparing food, who will stick around and clean up afterwards. You are being such a faithful servant, and we're so thankful for you. So thank you for that great ministry. If you're looking for an opportunity to serve, there's a lot of ways involved with that team. And so I invite you to see Ella Ferguson or Rebecca Stadnick or Charlotte. What a great way to serve. And so thank you for the way that you express your faith to families uh, in a time of a hard moment. So thank you for that wonderful ministry. I invite now our ushers to come forward for the giving and the receiving of God's tithes and our offerings. Let's go to God. God, we are thankful for the reminder of how much you use us in everyday ordinary life. What feels ordinary to us is holy to you and you use our ordinary self in holy ways and we're thankful. Now, well, God, we ask you to take these tithes and these offerings and use them, bless them, and may you be glorified in and through them. Bless the gift and the giver in Christ's name. Amen.
Let's go to God. Gracious God, we see you as creation and our nature is coming to life. As the colors spring forth, as the pollen is all around us, even making us aware of it in that way, oh God, we are filled with reminders of your awe, that your wonder, and all that you do in and through an everyday ordinary life. As we've just heard, mercy and grace falls down like rain. That is a gift of you. You've taught us how to live and to love and to be people of mercy and grace. Quick and abundant to shower those gifts on others. Use us, O God, and may those means of grace that have been showered upon us, we be quick to share with others. No, God, we're reminded of how much we need your presence and your faithfulness in our life. On the good days, on the hard days, and all days in between, it is you, oh God, that give us strength and hope to take yet another step, another day, as your faithfully claimed and beloved children. Oh God, so many in our midst are hurting, are dealing with hard moments. We raise all up to you, And we especially now are remembering the family and all who love Leon Smith for the wonderful life and the way he lived his faith here. For the family of Gary Woods, so many lives he touched. God, we raise all of them to you in a special way. Use us to bring hope and grace and mercy to them. May they know they're not alone. And may that remind us that we too are not alone. And oh God, is your faithful ones, hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next song is Alleluia, Alleluia. We'll sing three verses of that together. And as we do, if you would like someone to pray with you, we'd love the opportunity to do that. This, this time, this song is a song of prayer. And we invite you, uh, if you would like us to pray with you, feel free to come forward in the back. We'd love to join you in prayer as we sing.
Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Let us be known, let us be known by the way we love. Let us be known, let us be known by the way Friends, it's a joy to be with you today. Uh, as I meditated on the text, I went back in time, way back to 1981, when my wife and Carla and I moved to Tidmore Bend, Alabama, to take our very first church out in the country, Union Hill Church. And we were ready to start a family. And you would probably expect from a clergy couple that if we had children, we'd, we'd give them some sort of Christian or biblical name. And indeed, that was the case when our oldest was born. We named him Stephen. And it's been a joy for me over the years, especially when he was very young, to talk about his namesake as the first martyr in the church and what he did. So uh, that's our, our oldest son. And then our youngest son is Patrick. And so I was so glad over the years to be able to share with him about this young man who at age 16 was kidnapped in what we now know as Wales probably over in the United Kingdom, taken to Ireland and held as a shepherd slave for a number of years before escaping and making his way back to his native land. But 20 years later, he returned feeling the call of God to go back and evangelize the Irish people. And indeed, the nation of Ireland was for the most part converted to Christianity. So it's been a joy to talk with our children about their namesake. But there is a name that is even more important for them and for each one of us. And we discover that in 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he, that is Jesus, is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And it can be a bit challenging. We're going to take a, a, a more detailed look uh, at, at especially those last verses in just a few moments. But as we begin, I would just offer you this comment. By nature, we are God's offspring. By grace, we are God's children. Now, you follow me? By nature, we're God's offspring. By grace, we're God's children. There's a difference between the word paternity and parenthood, Right? Paternity means that you have, you know, fathered or mothered a child. You've created a child. One can exercise paternity and yet not be a father or mother, right? We think of fatherhood and motherhood as this nurturing, loving, devoted relationship. It's relationship-oriented, but one can father or mother a child and not have a relationship with that child. And so, therefore, if we think spiritually, uh, in terms of paternity, we're all God's children, all of the world. But in terms of being a son or a daughter, that happens when we enter a relationship with God. When we receive Jesus Christ as our loving God and Savior, that changes everything and we become God's children. A really important, I think, point to consider. 
Now, the scripture goes on to say here that, uh, little children, the world may not know you as, as Christ followers. They may not know you as a child of God because they do not know the Father. So if they don't know God the Father, they may not know you. I'm reminded of another appointment that Carl and I served, and we moved to Piedmont, Alabama in 1994. Anyone here been to Piedmont, Alabama? Nobody's been to Piedmont? Okay, some of you have been to You know Piedmont. I mean, you, you don't just drive through Piedmont. You have to have a reason to go there. Okay. But we moved to Piedmont, Alabama, and in the first few days, I went to the grocery store there, Lively's, and as I was going in the grocery store, there was... Uh, later, I found out he was kind of the town character, Gene Bailey. Uh, he rode around on a bike, honked his horn, and everybody knew Gene Bailey. And he was there at the entrance to the grocery store, and as I was walking in, he said, Hey, I turned around and said, Hi. He said, Who are you? And I said, Well, I'm Alan Weatherly. Who are you? Well, he didn't answer me. He just got this puzzled look. And then he said, Who's your daddy? <laughs> okay. He had no frame of reference. He could not place me anywhere, and so he needed to go back and see, okay, where, where did you come from, okay? But he didn't know my daddy, and he didn't know me. So I think, when I think of this verse here in this scripture, uh, it says, John says, you know, they may not know you because they don't know your daddy. And if they don't know your daddy, they're not going to know you. So just realize that as you live your life, not everybody's going to just put roses down in front of you. Uh, you may be insulted, you may be persecuted, people may not understand you, whatever, or be totally apathetic. I had a professor once said, Alan, just remember this, when you go through life, there are going to be 5% of the people in the world who are for you and are going to be with you no matter what. There are 5% of the people who are against you, and it doesn't matter what you do, they're going to be against you. And the other 90%, they don't care. <laughs> so, be that as it may. But, those first verses, I began to know them when I entered seminary in 1977. I was a relatively new Christian. And in the King James, a little modified form of that was, Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us, that we should be called the children of God. Anybody here been on an Emmaus walk? A few of you. Do you remember singing that on the Emmaus walk? Okay, behold what matter. Okay, I need your help. Okay, so please help me out because I'm going to go over to the piano. And so this is not necessarily going to be pretty, but I need your help. Okay, Susan, do you mind? No. Okay. I mean, I probably would be much better if I just asked you to play. <laughs> I know it would be much better. So here's how the tune goes. And those of you who know it, would you please sing robustly for me? Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us. That we should be called the children of God. That we should be called the children of God. Not very hard, is it? Let's try it one time. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given to us. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us. That we should be called the children of God. That we should be called the children of God. One more time now. Let's sing it out. Behold what manner of love the Father hath given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father given unto us. That we should be called the children of God. That we should be called the children of God. Yay, the good, I could hear you. Thank you. So that's a critical truth, isn't it? That we... Now, notice he starts out by saying we are called God's children. And then later he says we are God's children. So we're not just called. We are God's children. Okay. And whether the world knows us or not, we are. That is our identity. You know, what we do with our lives comes, arises out of who we think we are, who we belong to. So if you know your identity, you're going to live your life that way. 
But also notice that it's plural, right? We are the children of God. It's not just, I, I, I'm not going to just go have, if I'm going to have a party, uh, if I'm going to have a pity party even, I'm not going to have it by myself. I'm going to invite you to join me, right? So that's what my mother used to always say when I got down on myself. She'd say, if you're going to have a pity party, invite me. I'm going to join you too. But we're in it together. Behold what manner of God, love the Father has given unto us. We're in it together. Now, I just have a three-point sermon. All sermons are three points, right? Second point is this. We are becoming like Jesus. We are. Okay. It's inevitable and it's, here's a bigger word, inexorable. It's happening to us. We are becoming like Jesus. Now, we got a long way to go, right? We're under construction. We're a work in progress. I remember many years ago being on an Emmaus walk, and there was a woman, Lula Massey. She was the mother-in-law of Pete Furio, who was a well-known United Methodist pastor in this area. And Lula, on the Emmaus walk, she had a button on and the button had a bunch of letters on it. P, B, P, W, M, G, I, N, F, M, Y. <laughs> Please be patient with me. God is not finished with me yet. That's what that stood for. In her 80s, that's what she said. Just be patient. God's still working on me. I mean, I hope, yes, there's still sin in me. Even John himself said, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, right? I mean, we all do, but hopefully we're moving on. I said this earlier, Jill, and I'll just, you're a wonderful illustration. Jill, hopefully, as God is moving you to become like Jesus, you're more loving now than you were 30 years ago. Should I ask your husband? No, I would <laughs> preach it. That, I don't know how you could be. I've known you a long time, and you're so incredibly loving. But we're all on that journey, more and more. You know, Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Graham, was an incredible human being. She was every bit as equal to Billy Graham. And on her tombstone are these words, End of construction. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Isn't that something? But that's the journey we're on. And we move from being caught up in ourselves to being caught up in God and others. It's a slow, lifelong journey. And that brings me to our last point. We are afflicted with the sickness unto death. It's called sin, right? We all have it. We're born into that. It's this bent we have towards self-preservation at the cost of anything else. So our fear and our greed and our self-centeredness get a hold of us. And so uh, Easter Sunday was a great Sunday for my family. We were here at Stone River, and our grandchildren, Thomas and David, were here. And so we celebrated Easter, and then afterward, we went to their other grandparents' uh, home, uh, which Ted and Cynthia Acorn, many of you know them in this church. And we had a great time together with family. And then there was the Easter egg hunt. So all the little children, there were the plastic eggs with a little bit of, some had chains, nickels, dimes, quarters. Others had candy and chocolate. So the eggs were hidden, and the children went to hunt. And they came back, <coughs> and our four-year-old son had a little bucket, and it was filled with Easter eggs. And when he opened them up, there was some chains, but there was a lot of candy, a lot of candy and chocolate. So we were... At a table, and David was sitting there with his bucket, and my wife, Carla, and the grandchildren call her Queenie. And so <laughs> Carla looked to David and said, David, would you let Queenie have a piece of candy? And he said, no. <laughs> and she said, well, David, look at all the candy you have. You have so much, you wouldn't miss one piece of candy. Can I have just one little piece of candy? And he said, no. <laughs> And then David noticed that his older brother Thomas had left his bucket on the table too. And Thomas wasn't anywhere to be seen. Ooh. So David reached over and got a piece of candy from Thomas's bucket and gave it to Queenie. Now that's double original sin, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't have to teach David how to do that. He knew how to do that. That came natural. 
Uh, okay, so we laugh at a four-year-old, right, doing those sorts of things. But it does indicate for us that we all have a long way to go. Some of us more than others. Some of us make shipwreck of our lives and we get so caught up. But none of us is beyond the redemptive grace of God. Not a one of us. God can do miraculous things. And I think so often we may set the bar too low in our own lives. Not believing that the Holy Spirit can really do remarkable things for us. And I close with this. Some of you may know this story. A story about Louis Zamperini. You know, he, there was a book written about him called Unbroken in a movie that came out. He was quite the runner. He was in the Olympics. He was just a marvelous athlete. In World War II, he was a pilot, and he was shot down over the Pacific, and he spent some time in the water. I mean, he survived that, only to be captured by the Japanese and taken into internment camp, and there he was a POW for over three years. It was brutal for him. He nearly lost his life, but he managed to survive. Well, but when he came home, he was a broken man in so many ways. Far from God, he became an alcoholic, his marriage turned south and was heading toward a divorce. There was no future for Louis Zamperini. But his wife did convince him to go with her to hear a young preacher who was preaching in Los Angeles. And so they went and he heard Billy Graham preach. And that message that Billy Graham preached dug deep into his life and he came to believe in Jesus Christ and opened his heart to him and that balm of Gilead that only Jesus can pour out came upon him and he experienced the healing of God his marriage was healed he was able to conquer his alcoholism and he was even the most incredible miracle of all he found forgiveness in his heart for his tormentors and then he spent the rest of his life going to find those who had abused him and forgive them and going throughout the world sharing the love of Jesus he was even so loved by the Japanese people that he had the honor of carrying the Olympic torch in Japan whenever the Olympic Games were in Tokyo and there is a monument to him can you imagine an American pilot in World War II and there's a monument to him, a testimony to what Jesus can do. And when I hear that story, I think, Lord, you can do that to the most broken of us and your resurrected grace can come into our lives and indeed, only you can do it, but you can put Humpty Dumpty together again and then we are unbroken. Thanks be to God. For the miracle of his grace. Amen. So as we get a chance to be uh, invited into this service. Um, if you've not ever had a chance to welcome Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What an incredible opportunity today to welcome that love. If you would like a chance to be able to join this church family. We'd so welcome you. Uh, to be part of, of what we get a chance to do, how we get a chance to live out our faith. If you'd like a chance for us to pray with you or for you. If you get one a chance, uh, Wanda Conway, it's so great to see you. Welcome back after your long uh, recovery. It's so great to have you back. We'll make sure that we get a chance to hug one another, to greet one another, to be able to remind one another that we're not alone, right? To be able to remind each other that we're together. We're going to have a chance to sing this final hymn together and to stand. And then as we stand, let us sing and let us worship God together one more time before we get to go on out. Let's stand together if we can.
Remember, friends, by grace, you're a child of God. Rest in that blessed assurance and go forth with the peace and joy of Jesus, living this week for the glory of his name. Do not return evil for evil, but love without condition, being light to those who walk in darkness, lifting up those who are weak, supporting the faint-hearted, and the blessing of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will be with you always. Amen. This is my story, this is my song.